Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, over the last three days, we've had two systems interacting with the United States. The first one, which went racing from eastern Texas here over toward the eastern seaboard, is now sitting out in the open ocean and spinning. It's going to be sitting there for a while. On its exit, it did leave us with 150 reports of severe weather down here in southern Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and parts of northern Florida. And uh, 12 of those reports were tornadoes, and we're still kind of waiting to see what the official damage reports look like out of that. But it was a pretty rough day here uh, a couple of days ago. Meanwhile, in the midsection of the United States, right here in the Midwest, we had several dry days kind of adding up here in a row. But as this deeper trough kind of pulled its way into the Pacific Northwest over the last few days, it's now poised to cause problems in the north central part of the United States. So let's take a look at all of it and try to figure out how this is all going to go. First thing I want to show you, though, is a little bit better um, animation of that low that is sitting off the coast and this is just dramatic this was posted by Sierra uh, and you're just kind of zooming in here on the central circulation of that uh, low that's just sitting off the coast and like we reported yesterday in our long range update that one is going to sit there and spin over the next couple of days so it just pulled off the coast of North Carolina and it's going to just do this kind of loop to loop right here before heading on out to open ocean and as a consequence of doing that we're actually going to be seeing some very strong winds over the next uh, 48 hours or so along the east coast of the United States this is just a snap shot on Friday. So for our viewers that are along the East Coast, not only would this be bringing in some cloud cover and some precipitation on the back side of it, but some very strong winds. But for the midsection of the United States, it's going to be this frontal boundary that's going to get a lot of attention as it slowly moves across the U.S., initially causing quite a bit of snow in the north central part of the United States. So before we get there, though, I at least want to show you some good news. This is the first day in a long time that I can show you an SPC storm reports map where there are no reports. So April 1st, no reports across the United States. But so far this year, just to let you know where we currently stand by judging the, the, the severe weather season on tornadoes alone, we're right now sitting right about on the 10-year the, uh, the average, excuse me, uh, which is about 226 uh, tornadoes. So we had a, a we ramped up very quickly, but we've kind of come right back down to the climatological average. Currently, the, the 2020 um, tornado season ranks fifth uh, out of the last decades. So we're right there, like we think, right about average. Now, as we talked about in yesterday's long range update, some of the issues we seem to be having in the medium term forecast, so that's day 10 to 15, I can kind of tie back to this map. So this is a, a, a cool map. Let's take you all the way back to uh, the beginning of March. Just a snapshot here of aircraft flying. Well, this is how things looked at the end of March, a pretty dramatic reduction in total global flights. And why this is critical for atmospheric sciences is because each one of these aircraft report back weather conditions as they fly through the atmosphere. And we ingest that in our forecasting models, and it is a great data source to help improve our forecasting models, especially over places we don't have other observations. So specifically, uh, when we talk about North American weather, it's going to be the North Atlantic and the North Pacific Ocean. Without having these flights there, we're missing out on a lot of observations. Now, this is from Flight Radar 24. Great website. Go check it out. It's phenomenal. We're looking here at March, uh, excuse me, May uh, 2016 through March 2020. So we have four years worth of data here. And look at the drop off due to COVID-19 in total number of flights. It's just uh, dramatic here. And what this has done, I want to thank Simon here for posting this. As a part of our aircraft op observation system, we've dropped from, from nearly 900,000 uh, weather observations daily Okay, 900,000 weather observations daily from aircraft down to 400,000. So this is more than, than half we've, we've lost in terms of these observations. And I think this is part of the reason why forecasting and, and the medium and long term has been a bit tricky. We are not fully resolving the way we could uh, the behavior and, and flow of the jet stream, especially over the North Pacific. All right, that's just part of the problem. Just want to report it to you here. And this is what I'm talking about. You see, right now, the subtropical jet stream has been a mainstay of the flow pattern for a while. This is a uh, flow in the upper levels of the atmosphere today. Look at how bunched up the, the polar jet stream is, though, right now. 
And the question is going to be, where will these waves be in their position over the coming days? And will we continue to see such a strong subtropical branch of the jet stream? All right, that's the big question we have to answer. First things first, though, this is the deep trough that swept through the northwest. It is now pulling into the central plains very slowly. It's a very broad trough that's slowly moving through the Canadian prairies and into the northern part of the United States over the next couple of days. And it is the main culprit for the unsettled weather in that area. So taking a look here at our all hazards weather map. Let's start west to east. Where the cooler air is now setting up here, we do have coastal uh, frost and freeze warnings out for uh, parts of California's coast and southern Oregon's coast. But as that deeper trough pulls its, its best upper level support, that's where air can rise uh, here out of Wyoming and Montana, it then spreads into parts of, of northern parts of, of Nebraska, but then over toward uh, South Dakota and North Dakota and Minnesota. And that, that pink color that you see in there is winter storm morning and it's surrounded there by winter weather advisories. Now before this all gets going, this is what we got in terms of snow. So we had melted away a lot of the snow in this area and for snow extent to start April, this is already, uh, when you get east of the Rocky Mountains, not very much snow uh, at all. But uh, the problem with getting, getting that snow to melt recently, and I showed this yesterday in the long range, was that we've really increased our flooding problems here in the Red River of the North. And the rest of the Mississippi and its tributaries, a lot of gauges reporting minor uh, to moderate flooding there as well, with some down in the Delta showing major flooding. Well, this is going to be the issue. As that system pulls out into this area, we're going to be adding quite a bit of precipitation right there over the Red River of the North. And as the main frontal boundary, it's a strangely oriented one, kind of stalls out here over parts of of the south, we're going to be hammering Texas again with quite a bit more precipitation. And I've gotten some reports from some friends down there suggesting that uh, the, the start of this of this growing season for Texas, especially in that area that I circled here, has been quite rough due to so much rainfall. It's not just there. It's, it's uh, Oklahoma, it, it, it's Arkansas, and points to the east. And then we're going to be watching another really active pattern setting up here to just dump a lot of precipitation on California and especially a lot of mountain snow. So let's take a look at the snow first in the Northern Plains. I'm going to give you first the National Digital Forecast Database snapshot. So when you look at this, this is just going to be through Saturday night and we're looking at total accumulated snowfall. You can see that right over the Red River of the North, the potential for getting greater than six inches does exist. And there's looks to be a pocket in through here of greater than six inches as well. Comparing this to the GFS output, we do have in the similar area the heavier snow band here, but the GFS really wants to add quite a bit here that not only stretches from parts of the Red River Valley, uh, but extends that up toward Lake Winnipeg here in Manitoba. Do notice that behind this, so we're talking about the, the prairies of, of Saskatchewan and Alberta and then coming down into Montana, we're missing out on this snow. And lastly, I want to show you the European model. Now, the European is bringing in very high liquid content air uh, into, excuse me, uh, high precipitable water content air into this part of Minnesota. And you can see some of the numbers here are quite high. Now, we often find that our models struggle with these late season events because we don't get the snow ratios right. So the snow ratio, the liquid to snow ratio is off uh, due to the warm temperatures out ahead of this. So, but that that's kind of the region that we're watching most carefully. And what I want to do is I just want to show you total liquid, all right? So what do we notice on the back side over here where we're talking about the snow here? When it all melts, it would be the equivalent of getting somewhere between a quarter and a little bit over a half inch of, of rain. So this isn't like it's a, a massive flooding event. It's going to make things soggy, but it's not like maybe what we saw last mid-March, right, in 2019. But as we pull into this part of Minnesota, the total liquid equivalent it's going to fall as rain initially, then sleet and freezing rain, and then over to snow. You can see that we have up to an inch and a half of liquid there. So this is going to make the flood problems in the Red River Valley, um, unfortunately, much worse than they are right now. But let me show you another map. With the warm-up that I'll be showing you here in a few moments, this is how we expect snow depth to look by the time we get to next Wednesday morning. Uh, you can see that once you get outside of like the Black Hills area, the rest of that snow is melting. It's going to melt very quickly. And all the snow that you see here is, of course, at higher elevation, which we don't expect to melt. But this snow will only be short-lived on the ground after we bring in some warmer air here very, very soon. So don't be in too much despair. I do have some good news in that forecast overall. But when we think about this map, again, I came right back to it. This is our next week's worth of precipitation. Let's put it into the context of 
normal, right? Because when you look at this, you just see a lot of color on the map. But take a look at this. When you compare it to normal precipitation over this upcoming week, we do notice that there are sections of the United States which are showing up with the drier colors, representing not above average precipitation. And therefore, field work will be getting done even though the previous map looks quite wet across a big section of the United States. It is not going to be a soaker for everybody. All right. So with that, let's take a look at our severe weather threat uh, in the day today on Thursday. We just have a broad sector as that front advances where we could see thunderstorms. That's all that this area is indicating right here in the day on Thursday. For Friday, as the frontal boundary stalls here and high pressure forms off the East Coast, we're going to keep a close eye in this region in Texas. Again, a region that's seen repeated heavy rainfall events and severe weather for the last several weeks. So let's play this forward and kind of see how this system evolves here. So we're going to watch our high resolution NAM model take us all the way out until early morning on Saturday. So you see that front slowly advancing. Coming back to mid morning this morning, you notice, see the rain out ahead of it, the freezing rain and sleet sitting over the uh, Red River Valley, and then the snow on the back side. So this is why models are struggling with giving you snowfall amounts over the Red River. All right. As we play this forward, we see that throughout mid morning, and throughout the afternoon, as that front really orients itself north-south, we'll have snow on this side of it, freezing rain in the middle, and some sleet, and then rain out of it stretching down into Iowa. As the front progresses forward in the evening hours on Thursday into the early morning hours on Friday, you can just see how slow of a mover it is here through the state of Minnesota. But it stretches all the way back into Iowa and Kansas. And again, watch for some mixed precipitation here on the back side of this. More than likely a cold rain, but we do have to be on the lookout for some mixed precipitation in through this corridor. So this is 7 a.m. Friday. Let's move it through the day on Friday. And that's where we start to see, again, our chances for some stronger thunderstorms down in this area on the tail end of that front as it just slowly migrates here toward the east through the Corn Belt. So we're going to watch again on Friday evening this area down here for the potential for some strong to severe storms. And we just let this continue to play on out. This is where the boundary stalls over Texas, and we're going to watch for repeated chances of showers and storms again throughout the day on Saturday as well. Okay, where does the pattern take us after that? Well, we still see our omega-like block in the polar branch of the jet stream here in the North Pacific. And with this ridge pushing into Alaska, that'll be a key feature moving forward, as will this monstrous ridge sitting right here between the Hudson Bay and Greenland. But this pattern right here suggests that as we get into next week, we need to watch the systems that are coming through California to then eject into the central part of the United States and run over the top of this ridge. But with this ridge in place here, we're going to see a pretty sizable warm up across much of the eastern two thirds of the country in the near term. So let's take a look at the operational European model to see that. We're going to pause it right where we left off with our high res modeling. And we're going to see that by Saturday morning, afternoon, and evening, that frontal boundary stretches now through Michigan, Indiana, and southern Illinois back toward Texas, right? And as it pulls through by Sunday morning, what we're left with is just the remnants of scattered showers here. Now, the next system is then pulling into coastal uh, Oregon and California by Sunday morning. And you can see it plowing there along the coast. See it? And this is going to bring in uh, about a 36-hour heavy rainfall and snowfall event for California. And we're really going to be adding up the snow in the mountains. I'll show you those numbers in a second. But out ahead of it, as the whole atmosphere starts to dig into this trough, this is now Monday evening. See this high-pressure cell? We're feeding moisture right back here across the cotton belt. And as we do that and hits the delta, we're going to be seeing more showers and storms next Monday evening. Okay, as we pull forward, Little Clipper moves right through the Great Lakes states, but the main show is going to be happening right back here. And as this pulls out next Wednesday into Thursday, that's when we're going to be watching for another system to find, uh, finally hit through the end of next week. Meanwhile, as systems roll on the northern branch of the jet stream through, again, the Great Lakes states next Thursday, we do potentially have to watch out for a system coming through the parts of the north eastern United States. So the pattern in the near term isn't necessarily slowing down. To show you how much snow we are anticipating out west, we could add, as you see there over the Sierra Nevada mountains in the northern California ranges there, uh, we could easily be picking up uh, an additional uh, two to three feet of snow, which would be an excellent way to kind of finish the, the, the snowy season here uh, in, in California.
Okay, as we move forward, this is where things are trickiest, all right? What I have over here on the left is the GFS Ensemble, valid 10 days from now, so this will be next Sunday. And on the right, I have the same thing from the European. And look at the GFS and what's going on in the North Pacific. We see a much bigger ridge going into Alaska, allowing for troughing along the west part of the United States. And if we keep seeing troughing in through this area, they keep sweeping through, nothing will slow this pattern down if the GFS has its way. But over here on the right, I have the European. Much more elongated trough in the North Pacific. And what the European is doing is it's broadening out the ridge over more of the western United States. And the flow is coming in like this, and then pulling out into a much cooler pattern for the eastern part of North America. Now, this particular pattern, in both of them, the subtropical jet stream is still cranking underneath this. And so when you look and kind of understand what's really going on here, I kind of just detailed what some of our, our bigger teleconnections are doing. But uh, what I want to stress here is that the North Pacific pattern, what's going on in the North Pacific pattern, I apologize, the word key is off the edge there. This will be the area that we need to watch most carefully in the longer range. Now let's see what that does to precipitation. The GFS is over here on the left, and sure enough, like we said, if the broader troughs just sit here and the subtropical jet cuts underneath it, very wet for like the south and very wet through the central part of the United States. With the European taking that trough further off to the east, look at where the wet weather is. It's here in the North Atlantic, but the subtropical branch of the jet stream still cranks up and pulls into the southern region. So we see both models try to keep this area wet. So that's the only consistent feature. But the European with more upper level convergence, keeping the corn belt on the drier side of things. I made a case in yesterday's video that we have very low predictability right now in the long range forecasts. So let's at least see what this might you know, entail if we talk about temperatures. Now, for those of you in the, in the North Central Plains, you see this map today. Yes, it is, it is much cold, much colder than average. And unfortunately, that's going to continue. Watch this. This is uh, going to continue into tomorrow. So for Friday, big plunge of colder air behind that frontal boundary that just takes its dear sweet time to get across the Corn Belt here. But take a look at this. You ready? This is Friday's departure from normal. This is now Saturday, a cool start to the weekend in the midsection of the country, warm over here in the east, still cool in the northwest, all right? Sunday, ready for this? Monday, Tuesday, look at that. We'll get 70s way up here. This is going to be, I'm sorry, I'm just excited for this uh, because I'm home with my kids and they just want to be outside. And uh, so I can't wait to, to tell them the forecast. But the deeper trough digs in out west. And as we pull through, this is next Wednesday. So we've got some warmer air coming in after this unsettled weather toward the end of this week. Beyond that, what about day six through 10? Fairly good model agreement overall. This is the GFS on the left, European on the right. And what we end up seeing here is the main cold axis of air is coming out of Alaska and then here into the Canadian prairies of Alberta and Saskatchewan. There's also cooler air in the trough that's over California here, but much of the rest of the country is on the warmer side of things. The discrepancy starts to pull in as we get out to that day 15 time period. And uh, just a couple of things I'm going to be talking about. I'm just going to ask you to do this with me. Because we saw, if you remember my Monday update, major changes in the model runs from last week to this week, we're just going to have to watch this over the weekend. We've seen a trend recently warming the longer range forecast here, day 10 to 15. But still, both models are trying to paint this section of, the, of North America cold with the European advancing the trough further to the east, cooling down the east. Now, remember, mid-April cool weather is not disaster. Uh, it's not mid-April cold. It's just cooler than average. Uh, so we need to take a look at this and watch the model trends over the weekend. On Monday, by the way, we're going to talk about any sort of trend in frost dates as well. And I'm going to report some new maps to you. So look forward to that on Monday. To finish this up, I got some new notes about South America over there on the left. You can pause the video and read them. The most important thing about this is where we've been having trouble in Brazil has been in southern Brazil, specifically right here in Rio Grande do Sul. And they've had a pretty... Uh, uh, impactful drought that has gone on there that's that's really hurt crop. Uh, in the northern Garmi 
regions where we have a lot of our Safrina crop right now, Mato Grosso, Tocantins, Goyas, Bahia, that area. Uh, even though you see a little bit drier forecast in the next 10 days, no major impacts. In Argentina down here, they're in the middle of harvest uh, for both corn and soybeans. The drier weather will help that, but some of the full season stuff that is still maturing, uh, this drier weather could be impactful. With that, we're going to wrap it up right here. Have a great end to your week, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.